run through a few things today. This is where things can get a little bit tricky because significant figures is something that we'll be talking about in this class, and it'll come up over and over and over and over again. And it's a easy point to earn when you take the AP Chemistry exam is to get the significant figures question correct. Okay. So as far as measurement, any measurement that you make has some amount of uncertainty depending on the precision of the measuring device. For instance, a bathroom scale will typically read to the nearest pound or maybe to the nearest tenth of a pound. Um, or if you have it in kilograms, it may read to the nearest tenth of a kilogram. So you couldn't really use it to measure down to individual ounces or individual grams. So for instance, if you stood on a bathroom scale and then you pick up a paper clip and you stand on the bathroom scale again, it's probably going to say you weigh exactly the same, even though now that you're holding that paper clip in your hand, you clearly weigh more. Uh, that's because the bathroom scale is not a high precision measuring device. It's just ballparking how much you weigh. Uh, there's a digit that is estimated when taking measurements. That's considered to be the uncertain digit. And there's this thing called significant digits or significant figures. Those are all of the digits that we are certain of, plus the first digit that we have to estimate. For instance, if you're using a ruler, you have to kind of make a judgment at some point when you're measuring about exactly what that last digit is that you're going to write down. So for instance, if we look at this, uh, this is a burette. Uh, we'll talk more about how these work. You'll notice that the volume increases as you go down. And we have 20 and 21 and 22 and 23. And there it looks like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. It looks like each one of these lines represents a tenth of a milliliter. So this volume, we're going to read it to the bottom of the meniscus. It looks like it's between 20.1 and 20.2. So if I were writing this volume down, I would probably say that that volume is 20.15. Now you could try to be really clever and say that looks a little closer to 20.16 or 20.14, but I don't think that your brain and your eyesight is good enough to envision 10 individual little markings in between here to estimate that really well. So I would just call it 20.15. Now, if you thought that it was exactly on the 20.1 line, then what you would write is not just 20.15. One, you would write 20.10 because you're estimating that that's like exactly on down to the hundredth of a milliliter. You would call it 20.10. That's obviously not the case here. So we're going to call this actual thing right here 20.15. Hope that makes a little bit of sense. All right, so the next thing we're going to talk about is accuracy and precision. So accuracy is the agreement of a measurement or a particular value with the true value. All right. So for instance, um, if I take a one kilogram calibrated weight and I put it on a scale and it says that it weighs one kilogram, that scale is accurate. If it says it weighs two kilograms, it's not accurate. In other words, accuracy is getting the right answer. Precision is getting the same answer over and over again. So for instance, if I put that one kilogram calibrated mass on a scale and it says two kilograms and every time I weigh it, it says it's exactly two kilograms, that scale is very precise, but it's completely inaccurate. Um, precision is something that we want to have in our measuring devices, we want them to give us the same values over and over again, which is why if we're doing a lab, it's important that you use the same digital balance for all of your weighing throughout the lab so that if your balance is inaccurate but precise, then as you subtract and add and mathematically manipulate your measurements, 
all of those, uh, that inaccuracy is carried through all the way to the end. So any inaccuracy hopefully subtracts itself out. For instance, if it, we, if it reads everything half a gram too high, hopefully that will work itself out in the end in your calculations. You don't want to keep introducing additional sources of error. Uh, systematic error occurs the same way each time, usually because of a defect in the uh, measurement, measuring device or you don't know how to use the measuring device. And then uh, random errors occur in estimating the last value of a measurement, and those are reduced by averaging several measurements. For instance, uh, some of our digital balances read to the thousandth of a gram. And if you put it on there once, it may give you one digit and it may say it's like uh, 1.355 grams. And then you weigh it again, it says 1.356 grams. So it's estimating that last digit and that's some random error that can occur in there. So this kind of shows a representation of this. Uh, if you're trying to hit the bullseye on a dartboard, this is neither accurate nor precise. This is fairly precise, but you've missed the mark. And then this is both precise and accurate. Temperature, we've touched on this a little bit before. These are the three major temperature scales. Um, they go all the way down to absolute zero is zero Kelvins, negative 273 Celsius, negative 459 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, the Fahrenheit scale is a really interesting one historically. Um, scientifically, it doesn't have a whole lot of practical use. We pretty much in science classes use Celsius and Kelvins. The nice thing about the Kelvin scale is since its lowest possible reading is zero, there's no negative numbers. So when we do math involving temperatures, we don't have to worry about the effect of putting a negative number into our calculations. All right, so now for the meat of the lesson, significant figures and calculations. So if you're looking at a measurement that has been recorded somewhere, we need to know which digits in that measurement actually count. And the issue is always going to be with zeros. So if there's a number and there's no zeros in it, then all of the digits in that number are significant. So the number 3,456 has four significant figures. You got the thousands place, the hundreds place, the tens place, and the ones place. Zeros that are in front of the first uh, integer value that's not a zero do not count. So the number 0 0.048 has two significant figures, the four and the eight. So it's at the tenths, uh, not at the tenths, at the hundred, hundredths and the thousandths place. This number has two significant figures. Captive zeros, zeros that are between two non-zero numbers, they always count. So the number 16.07 the one, the six, the zero, and the seven are significant. That has four significant figures. That means that we've read this measurement all the way down to the hundredths place, and we're sure about all of those. Let me go back to the leading zeros part. This, these zeros here are just placeholders. If you had written this number in scientific notation, that would be 4.8 times 10 to the negative two. It would just have the two significant figures, the four and the eight. Those two zeros there are just, they're just placeholders. Zeros at the end of a number count only if there's a decimal point in the number. So the number 9.300 has four significant figures, the nine, the three, and the two zeros. That signifies that we've made a measurement all the way out to the thousandths place, and that is a zero. The number 150 with no decimal places has two significant figures. Um, for instance, you could say ballparking the Civil War ended 150 years ago. That's um, a ballpark. It didn't exactly end 150 years ago. It ended more than that. Um, so we're going to do some practice with that, but there is one exception to all of this stuff with significant figures, and that is things that are not measurements, but exact numbers. So if you are counting things that you can actually see, 
those have an infinite number of significant figures, which becomes important when we do math. So for instance, if you're counting the number of uh, the number of eggs in your refrigerator, uh, you're infinitely sure it's exactly seven eggs are in your refrigerator. There's not seven and a half eggs. You either have an egg or you don't. Um, same thing works when you're counting people. You either have a person or you don't have a person. You don't have half of a person. Uh, there's other cases where, for instance, one inch has be, been defined as 2.54 centimeters exactly. So if you were using this conversion, you don't gain or lose significant figures with this. But, yeah. And counting numbers in infinite significant digits. For instance, if you said three people, well, there's exactly three people. People only come in whole number quantities. Where this becomes very important is when you're doing math with significant figures because this device right here, calculator, can give you an artificial sense of confidence in your measurements. It can make a measurement seem more precise than it actually is. And doing math cannot improve the quality of a measuring device. So for instance, if you use a bathroom scale and you determine that somebody weighs 150 pounds, and then you use an analytical balance in a science lab and you find that um, you have um, a paper clip that weighs 0 0.135 grams. Well, you can't just convert those into a common unit and just add them together because a bathroom scale doesn't have the same level of precision as how you measured that paper clip. And so adding the two together, you can't just give yourself an artificial sense of confidence in your measurement, if that makes sense. Or for instance, if you uh, are measuring um, a distance using the trip meter in your car. Your car is measuring, say, to the nearest mile. So for instance, when I drive to Topsail High School, it, my car says 13 miles. I can't then just pull out a tape measure and measure a few more feet to the front door from the parking lot and get and add that together and say, oh, well, I live exactly this many feet from Topsail High School because my car is not measuring to the nearest foot. I hate using customary units, but yeah. I'll, I'll never do that again, hopefully. All right, so with math, when you multiply and divide, however many significant figures you had in your least precise measurement, that's how many significant figures your answer should have. So for instance, if you take 2.3 times 0.04, well, if you multiply that out, your calculator says the answer is 0 0.092. Well, this number, the 2.3, that's two significant figures. This number, the 0 0.04, that's only one significant figure because that zero doesn't count. So you multiply them together, we need to drop the two. We only need one significant figure in our answer. So that becomes 0.09. When you add and subtract, what matters is the number of decimal places. So if you take 53.2 plus 1.08 plus 0 0.003 and you add those, uh, your calculator would say the answer is 54.283. So this number goes to the tenths place, this goes to the hundredths place, this goes to the thousandths place. So we're going to round our answer off to just the tenths place. So we'll call this 54 point, and this 8 will cause us to round the 2 up. So we'll call it 54.3. And when rounding, um, if you're doing a series of multiplication and division or addition and subtraction, you round everything off at the end. And obviously, if the number is less than 5, you round down. Greater than 5, you round up. Typically, when it is 5, you round up. Some people use really crazy rules where if the number 
ends in a five. Then if the next digit is even, you round up. And if it's odd, you round down because otherwise always rounding up on five will artificially inflate your numbers. But we'll just stick with the rules that you learned in what elementary school and round up if it's a five. That'll work for us. So I've got this slide with some samples on it and I suggest that you pause the video and try these. I'm going to put the answers in Google Classroom uh, in the description with this video. Um, so take a minute and try these problems and then I'll also, in just a second, do a walkthrough of how many or where you should round your answer over here. All right, hopefully you've taken a minute to do these problems now. When you do the problems over on this side where we're doing math, for this problem, since it's multiplication, what matters is the number of significant figures. So we have three sig figs, we have four significant figures, our answer should have three. In B, this is division. Our answer should have just one significant figure. In C, uh, for scientific notation, just be aware that the 2, the 6, and the 1, those are, all, are only significant figures. The times 10 to the negative 1, that doesn't count in our significant figures. So we have three significant figures, three significant figures. Our answer should have three. For D, since we're doing addition, we should round to the hundredths place. For E, we should round to the tenths place. That's addition and subtraction. F, we're back to doing division. It's the number of significant figures. Our answer needs three significant figures. So hopefully you did all right with this.